Thank you, Jim. I'm very grateful to be here as a part of this panel and with such a fine group of participants. Um, thank you all for coming to an early morning session. Uh, I'm charged with talking about food reward and its influence on eating behavior and to look a little bit at controversies in the field and possible applications to concepts like food addiction. So I'll try to do that this morning. And first I'd like to talk about um, the relationship of food reward circuitry to homeostatic eating circuitry. Because you know traditionally I think they've been very different topics. For the last 50 years, if we came to conferences, we'd often go to separate sessions on food homeostasis and physiology, the mechanisms of um, homeostatic eating, versus other separate sessions on reward circuitry related to topics like addiction. But in the last, and in neuroscience textbooks, for example, on um, those would be separate chapters on homeostasis for food and eating versus brain reward circuitry. But in the last 10 years, I think it's become very clear that the brain doesn't keep these topics separate. These circuits interact, brain reward circuitry with homeostatic circuitry. They interact so intimately that we probably can't fully understand eating behavior unless we have an understanding of brain reward circuitry. So I'll talk a little bit about perspectives on brain reward circuitry um, and how this relates to eating and some controversies on the field of brain reward circuitry related to eating and applications. For a perspective on brain reward circuitry, my own perspective is that it's probably important to recognize the brain sees a difference between liking the food that's pleasant and wanting that same food that's pleasant. This is a psychological difference between liking and wanting, but it's a neural difference. It comes out of uh, neural dedication to different functions, as we'll see in a moment. So we have building blocks of liking versus wanting, even though in our experience, they combine together into the same food reward. We want to see the circuitry of liking and wanting components in the brain. Maybe the best way to give you an illustration of the difference between wanting a food versus liking a food is simply to give a concrete example of wanting that can occur in the absence of liking, of mechanisms that enhance and create very intense wants but don't have to intensify the liking for the same reward. That's what we'll do first. There's many ways to do this, to create wanting for food that's very intense without increasing the liking for it. Um, I'll give you one concrete example, one of our more recent ones through an optogenetic technique, a way of stimulating brain mesolimbic dopamine systems um, here heading to the nucleus accumbens and central amygdala specifically, we're going to turn it on to create an intensification of wanting a food without intensifying the liking, the pleasure liking for the food. And you may see that this intense wanting for food is very focused, possibly in a way that bears on concepts like food addictions. For those of you who aren't familiar with optogenetics, let me just spend 30 seconds on how this is going to stimulate the brain. Basically, it's a technique developed by Carl Dieseroth and others who have um, cleverly come up with ways to stimulate brain systems using laser light uh, and viral vector therapy. First, a microinjection under surgical conditions is made into the brain. The virus carries the gene for the opsin photoreceptor. In this case, the injection goes into the amygdala. The virus is injected there to implant the gene for the photoreceptor. As the gene makes these photoreceptors, the channel rhodopsin molecules, they are expressed on the membrane of the neuron, and later on, if blue light is shown upon them, they will um, open sodium gates and calcium ion gates to excite the neuron, and the neuron will fire. So that's what we're going to do here. But the task you're gonna see, the situation of eating, is this. This is a rat who's learning that it can earn sugary rewards. It can earn sugar rewards either by pressing the lever on the right, the purple lever, it'll earn a sugar pellet, or it could press the lever on the left, you see there the blue lever, it would earn a sugar pellet, and also if it presses the blue lever there, it will, the sugar pellet will be accompanied by laser stimulation of its amygdala. So if it presses the blue lever, it earns sugar plus, sugar plus laser. If it presses the right lever, the purple lever, it would earn an equally good sugar pellet. And you'll see it wants them both. It learns this, it wants them both. Then it gets a choice, and you'll see what happens with the choice. Here's the rat. 
There's a left lever and a right lever. Here's the left lever. It comes out. This is the laser lever. The rat has pressed the lever. It earns the sugar pellet. It's getting the sugar pellet, and you can see it's getting the laser stimulation. That's a training trial. Now here's a right lever training trial. The right lever comes out. It, if it presses it, it'll get a sugar pellet, and you can see it's eagerly pressing the lever and nibbling on that lever, and now it gets its sugar pellet. It's hard to see a difference between those two levers. It seems to want them both. It can earn the sugar pellets, and it avidly does. But now it has a choice. Both levers come out. It goes to the laser lever, you see. It takes the sugar pellet, goes back to the laser lever. Stays on the laser-associated lever. It won't leave the laser sugar pellet lever, even though the other lever, which would earn as equally nice a sugar pellet, is right there. It absolutely ignores that other lever now with the choice. It seems very, very focused. This is an intense want on just this one laser-associated lever that earns the sugar pellet. Why is it doing that? Why is that such an intense wanting on this laser-associated lever? Does it want that sugar more because the laser makes it like that sugar more? Is that what the laser is doing, increasing the palatability of the sugar? Well, how would we know? How would one ever ask a rat if it tastes better, this sugar under laser? Well, there might be a way, a way similar to the way human parents have asked their infants for millennia whether the infant likes a taste or not. This is a technique for infants devised originally by Jacob Steiner in Israel and applied by Harvey Grill and Ralph Norgan originally to rats. Let's see the technique. This is a sugar water. This is a human infant on the first day of life responding to sugar water with that tongue protrusion. Here's a rat from underneath, slowed up. You can see it's getting a sugar infusion into its mouth painlessly through oral cannula. And you can see what it does, these tongue protrusions and licking of the lips laterally to the sugar. Let's see bitter, bitter. A little bit different. Gapes. Wrinkling of the brow and eye, this human infant, the rat can't wrinkle its brows or nose, but it can gape, it can head shake, it can flail its forelimbs, it'll do all those to bitters. That's what it does to taste it likes or dislikes. Let's go back to the laser. Does the laser make it like the sugar more? There's a number of things that would increase the liking for the sugar. Hunger would increase the liking for the sugar. A number of brain manipulations would increase the liking for the sugar. Um, does the laser? The answer is no. These are the positive liking reactions, black without the laser, blue with the laser to a sugar pellet, and you can see the laser has absolutely no effect on these liking, facial liking reactions to the sugar. Is it that the rat wants that laser itself? Is it the laser somehow a reward or pleasure? Was that why the rat was so focused on the sugar that went with central amygdala laser? Well, the answer seems to be not really. Um, this is a self-stimulation task in which the rat could just earn laser alone by touching one metal spout, the blue associated spout, or else touch the other spout, which would not produce any laser. There's nothing else that happens. There's no sugar here. It's just pure self-stimulation of the laser. And that's not a significant difference. It doesn't really seem that the rat is avidly pursuing the laser by itself. It's not avoiding the laser by itself either. The laser isn't inducing an aversive drive that makes it eat sugar or seek sugar to escape the aversive drive. The laser seems relatively neutral by itself. Yet, that's the same laser that produced this divergence where that black line rising and rising was the preference for the sugar associated with laser, and the other line with the white circles was the, laser, was the equally good sugar, but had no laser. So this is a very, very focused pursuit and consumption uh, induced by a brain manipulation that's tapping into the mesolimbic system. As I said, there's many ways to produce this kind of enhancement of wanting. It could be measured in a learned task such as you saw, or it could be measured in pure, raw food intake. Um, a number of stimulations, for example, of the nucleus accumbens, either dopamine stimulations or even opioid stimulations of the nucleus accumbens, as a number of people here have shown, produce great increases in food intake. This is an example here we're seeing in, in the, the brain in the upper right, inside that circle is the nucleus accumbens. And then blown up at the lower left is the nucleus accumbens medial shell all by itself. And what you're seeing in the color green is a causation map. 
Every splotch of green there is a microinjection that stimulates the opioid receptors in the nucleus accumbens, mu opioid receptors. And where it's green, it's increasing food intake. It may be doubling it at the light green. It may be increasing it by 400% at the middle green. It may be increasing it by up to eight times the normal intake at the dark green. And throughout the nucleus accumbens, these opioid stimulations and also amphetamine dopamine stimulations will increase food intake. These opioid stimulations you can see are producing up to eight times increases in palatable food intake um, whenever you stimulate this nucleus accumbens and a number of structures beyond that. Here in green are all sites where various forms of stimulation can increase food intake and the pursuit of food, the seeking of food. Um, in the amygdala, as we saw with the laser, in the nucleus accumbens, as we just saw, also in the ventral pallidum, the lateral hypothalamus, areas of the limbic prefrontal cortex. We can stimulate with dopamine microinjections or opioid microinjections, with stress-related CRF microinjections, increase intake and pursuit of the sugars, um, with the optogenetic stimulation, as you saw, and wherever it's green, these increases in wanting for food are not accompanied by any detectable increase in the liking for food measured in the way that we just saw with the amygdala laser. Liking exists, but the system for wanting is so much larger and so much more robust that liking is sort of just nestled within it as a tinier circuit within this large, robust wanting circuit. But even we can enhance pleasure liking for food, even by the measure that I showed you those, with those facial reactions. Wherever you see red here, there are ways to increase liking. So let's look quickly at that. What generates the liking for food rewards? There are generators of sensory pleasure nestled within the limbic circuits. We call them hedonic hotspots because there's little spots localized in, within structures where stimulation can increase the liking for food as well as the wanting. Um, a number of sites within the same circuitry that we've looked at. Let's focus on the nucleus accumbens again in this red circle well, again, the medial shell, and let's again look at opioid stimulation. There's opioids throughout the striatal system, including the nucleus accumbens. Here we're seeing a causation map again, but this is not of food intake. These are of liking reactions. Again, every splotch is a microinjection of a mu-stimulating agonist. If it's red or orange, it's increasing the positive liking reactions to sucrose. It may be increasing them by 50% or doubling them or by 250%. In the rostral, dorsal, rostral is uh, on your left, caudal is posterior is on your right. In the rostral dorsal part of the medial shell, you can see red and orange. There's a hot spot there that increases these liking reactions. You could compare that to food intake at the, by the same microinjections. The stimulation of wanting to eat is you can see wherever there was liking, but it's also much larger. If we were to lay onto this one last thing, which would be the ability to, of, of the opioid microinjection to make bitter tastes less nasty, to suppress the aversiveness of a taste, we can see here in purple there's sort of a, a large caudal zone, but if we compare the hedonic hotspot for actually intensifying the pleasure of the sweetness, it's relatively small here. Um, it's about a third of the medial shell is the hedonic hotspot, and it has special anatomical features. It's about one-tenth of the entire nucleus accumbens because the nucleus accumbens core and lateral shell would also be all green but not have any of the red hotspot. They would extend in front of the screen towards us and behind the screen. It would be all green. So the hotspot is really only about one-tenth of this nucleus accumbens structure. There's also a hedonic hotspot in the ventral pallidum, which is about one-third of it. That's at the bottom of the brain, the red splotch in the center bottom. There's also a hedonic hotspot in the brain stem. And we're now finding a couple, we think, in small regions of the prefrontal cortex, in the orbital frontal cortex, and in the insula cortex. So there's a circuitry, a delicate circuitry, all interconnected for enhancing the liking of taste. That's a perspective. Um, these signals that can do it, that can amplify it, are opioid, also endocannabinoid, also benzodiazepine, and recently orexin. 
in the hot spots will increase liking. They're in those structures there. The circuit comes on together when you enhance pleasure. It seems to require unanimity among the parts. If you block any, any part of this, you can't, you won't enhance the pleasure, even under stimulation, and it acts in a hierarchical way. Well, that's, a, that's my personal perspective on um, the basic principles of reward. But what about the applications for human eating and obesity and eating disorders and possibly concepts like addiction? Well, I don't actually study um, human eating patterns, so in a sense I'm the wrong person to ask, but I do read papers about it, these kinds of papers that have taken the concepts and looked at liking and wanting aspects um, in people. But there's probably, if we were to say, what is the role of these systems in human eating? There's one major controversy still running throughout the neuroscience of reward field that has to be acknowledged before we could, and, and understood, before we could ever truly come up with the best applica applications. And this major controversy really settles, hinges on what is the role of dopamine mesolimbic systems in reward and motivation and addiction for drugs as well as for foods. What is its role? I've presented you a view of dopamine as a sort of wanting mechanism. But many of you may know that there's, po there's problems for this view. Here's two big problems. For eating, one big problem is, isn't amphetamine a famous dieting aid going back to the 1960s? And aren't modern dieting aids, many of them, related as sort of descendants of amphetamine? How could dopamine be a pro-wanting mechanism if it's, an amph if it's a, a dieting drug, if it has um, anorexic effects? Well, I think the answer to that is that it hinges entirely on which brain structure the amphetamine is in. Amphetamine does have anorexic dieting effects in the hypothalamus and in a couple of other brain structures, some sites in the striatum, the neostriatum. But in the nucleus accumbens, I can tell you from my own experience that amphetamine microinjections increase eating. They produce the pro-wanting effects, and a number of other people have found that as well, including perhaps some in the audience here. So I think it isn't so much a contradiction, it's understanding which brain dopamine systems are being most activated in particular moments. But perhaps a more persisting and bigger conceptual problem for the view I presented is the fact, the undeniable fact, that in very obese humans, one can detect reductions in the level of dopamine receptors, especially D2 receptors, reductions in people who are severely obese. Um, this is a study from um, Wang et al. and Nora Volkow's group, but there's been many studies, and in animal experiments, the same thing can be demonstrated. We've seen it too, uh, reductions in D2. How, if D2 is going down, a notion has been that low dopamine might actually have been dopamine mediating pleasure, and when dopamine goes down, people overeat to bring the pleasure back. Is that happening? Well, there's no question that this happens, this reduction. What I think the question on our minds should be is, is a dopamine receptor reduction the cause of, OD, of overeating? Or is it perhaps a consequence of obesity and of overeating and even of overstimulation of brain reward systems in people who are overeating? <clears throat> My own view is that it is a consequence. In our lab, we've been able to induce it as a consequence by giving rats very highly palatable diet and encouraging them to gain weight. But there's evidence, I think, now emerging more and more as the pendulum of human neuroimaging evidence swings, evidence that dope, that um, it's a consequence also in humans, and in fact, new evidence that humans who are obese may actually have higher levels of dopamine release, which would be more consistent with the dopamine is wanting mechanism. So this is the view here, weighing it all. The same group, but a more recent paper showing that increases in dopamine um, are occurring in binge eaters when they're exposed to food. The, the higher the binge eating scores, the higher the increase in dopamine. And by a different team um, of demonstrations that there's higher dopamine release in going along with increases in body weight, at least through moderate ranges of obesity. When one gets to the really high ranges of obesity, then the consequence of downregulation begins to kick in and dopamine systems start to get suppressed again. So I think there are po potential resolutions. This isn't the final word. It's an emerging story, but there are potential resolutions. 
The answer to that question matters because the whole nature of what's going on in addiction, whether it's drug addiction or potentially food addiction or food overeating at least, hinges a little bit on these roles of these brain systems. If it's a wanting mechanism, if dopamine systems were a wanting mechanism, that, then that opens the way for things like this. This is my colleague Terry Robinson's view of addiction, the sensitization theory of addiction. It basically says that wanting for drugs in addicts could go up and up over time, even if the pleasure of the drugs went down over time, if their brain dopamine systems were being sensitized, being made hyperreactive. That happens in, an, in susceptible individuals. Not everybody's equally susceptible, but it happens in susceptible individuals caused by addictive drugs. And recently, a number of studies, um, including Nicole and a, a number of studies, um, have shown that it, food regimens of either overeating or dieting um, or cycles of binge eating and dieting can induce brain sensitization of dopamine systems, which would put us into this potential camp. If that happened, all I would say is that based on what we've seen with the mechanisms of incentive salience, sensitized food wanting will have features. It'll interact with cues, learned cues for food. They'll produce temporary pulses. They'll be able to produce temporary pulses of increased wanting, but the level of wanting will vary. It will vary across individuals depending on their brain state, and it will even vary within an individual from cue to cue, from moment to moment, depending on their brain state at that moment. Brain increases in, act in mesolimbic reactivity, increases the pulses. If it happens, then just like addicts can have intense wanting triggered by their cues, possibly some food cues would do this to people. The important point to remember is that it's not a qualitatively different mechanism in anyone when that happens. It's just a more intense version of what happens to all of us when we encounter the cues that happen to be able to trigger incentive wanting in us. Sensitization just does it. So I'll end, I'll just end with concluding implications that I see and would suggest for the possibility of eating disorders and food addiction. I was asked to address, does food addiction exist? We were all asked to address that. So here's my personal answer, and we'll hear better answers from the other members of the panel. I, 10 years ago, I would have said, I don't see how it's possible. Um, drugs do sensitize brain dopamine systems. I didn't know then that food regimens could. Now, it seems it does, and I believe now that it does. So I no longer think it's impossible in theory. I believe that it is possible in theory. Um, the question is, empirically, is it possible? And there's increasing evidence that it might happen in some individuals in some conditions. But in practice, I would leave with four suggestions to the extent that food addiction-like phenomena exist. Four suggestions in thinking about it. First is that it will always, these conditions will always be within a normal continuum. They'll be at an extreme end of a normal continuum, but they're not a qualitatively different mechanism. Even drug addiction, I think, is not a qualitatively different mechanism. It's an intensification of particular normal mechanisms. And I think it will be helpful in thinking about it to focus on the possibility of whether similar mechanisms that are operating in drug addiction are operating in food rather than to simply focus on the category of addiction. The category of addiction is always problematic, even in drug addiction, because people don't agree on what the nature of addiction is, even in drug addiction. Walk into a drug addiction meeting and say, is addiction a disease of the brain? And see what happens. Depending on which group you're talking to in that drug addiction, um, you'll get very different answers. Um, so we want to focus on mechanisms that can give rise to addictive-like syndromes, not so much the category. Third suggestion I would make is that individuals will differ, individual drug addicts differ, and individuals will differ even within the category of obesity or within binge eating categories. Some individuals might show particular sensitized mesolimbic brain uh, responses, for example, to foods or to food cues, and there will be differences perhaps in liking versus wanting components. The studies that I showed you on that screen, the, the PDF of titles often are looking at liking versus wanting aspects of in binge eating and in obese. And very often I think it's a wanting-like change that can occur without a liking-like change when some reward difference is found. The very last 
thing I would suggest is that to the extent that excessive wanting, sensitized wanting, is ever found in food addicts or binge eaters or particular obese individuals, whatever you want to call them, it will have certain features that will be recognizable. So there will be psychological features and neural features. Psychological features are they'll be linked to cues, triggered by cues, intense urges, but not all the time. There'll be special states of the brain that make them susceptible to intense triggers of urges. Um, and there'll be, at that moment, intense mesolimbic brain activations. And the last point is, that if there is a sensitized wanting, that's not an irresistible urge. It's not a constant urge. It's a probabilistic urge. Temptation is always probabilistic. We encounter cues for rewards 100 times. A drug addict must successfully resist them 100 out of 100 times in order not to relapse. A someone who has a food eating problem must resist them not just some of the time, but many times, otherwise the problem emerges again. And that's what's difficult, because it's the resistance of 100% that makes it so difficult. A sing even single failures can sometimes have consequences, devastating consequences in drug addiction, um, but uh, severe enough consequences in food eating issues too. So we're really dealing with the mechanism at that moment of cue trigger temptation and the next moment and the next moment and since the me mechanism can change with brain state we have to accommodate that entire range of brain cue interactions. That's all I'll say. The experiments that I've done come from these collaborators. I really do nothing. I just tell you about them later. But thank you for your attention. Thank you.